Rama, when I did my PhD in neurophysiology, I wanted to study the brain so I could understand the mind. And although I learned a lot about methodology and science, I, I really made no progress in understanding the mind. But when I first read your work uh, in these remarkable uh, uh, cases of anomalies, all different kinds of anomalies, <laughs> uh, you really do make progress in showing how the, the brain leads to our mental experiences. So walk me through how that works. Well, these different techniques complement each other, I think, and each person has his own taste <laughs> and wisdom. But one, thing, one point I'd like to make is look at the history of ideas in neuroscience and brain research in the last 50 years. Until about 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, the prevailing model was what I call the serial hierarchical bucket brigade modular architecture of the brain. <laughs> that sensory, sensory information comes in, processed by sensory systems, sent to area 17, the first area of the sensory information comes in, and then something is computed, and then, then next, next, next area something else is computed, and it's a hierarchy. It goes up to the very top the climax of object recognition. Aha, I see a pig, or whatever. Yeah. Now this is wrong. It turns out, in fact, at every stage in processing, the messages go backwards to bias the computation. And the successive iterations culminate eventually in object recognition. Mm. It reduces the problem, problem space enormously. Mm. makes it much more effective and, and, and mm. rapid, okay? Now secondly, that's one, one view, that it's not a hierarchy. There are feedback pathways modulating the information. Secondly, the modules interact with each other to a tremendous extent. For example, who would have thought vision could affect a phantom pain, modulate pain? Even in real arm, pain in a real arm can be modulated by visual input. That's very striking. Third, there's, there's a condition called RSD, which I don't have time to go into. A third condition called RSD, where you've got bone atrophy and pain, excruciating pain uh, and following nerve injury, you know, swelling, uh, temperature, immobilization, all of that, paralysis. And the arm becomes four times as big. Mm -hmm. The normal arm excruciating painful and you're stuck with life. Using a mirror and visual input, this subsides quite a bit. You know, in about two thousand patients, it goes away completely. The only known cure for, mm -hmm. for RSD. Mm -hmm. Here you're talking about the brain affecting not just... Not, Interaction not just between different brain modules, the brain modules affecting the skin and bones. Mm. Talk about mind-body interaction. Yeah, yeah. So you, lateral interaction between brain modules, backwards interaction going back to sensory systems from higher modules, brain modules to skin and bones, <laughs> and mirror neurons interacting with other brains. <laughs> you think of a brain now as a, as a very different picture from what you get in anatomy textbooks yeah. about area 17, area 18, and yeah. module It's a good place to start. But long, it's time that we left it behind and moved on. Mm, mm. So, w what are some uh, specific uh, syndromes that uh, l l give you that confidence to see this very complex interaction with uh, uh, not just afferent, but efferent, uh, going back to the lower areas, so-called lower areas, and helping to define the uh, the original perceptions? Well, I think the most classic example I know of is RSD, or called reflex sympathetic dystrophy. But any one of us has a tiny injury to a metacarpal bone, to a finger bone, then the arm can be immobilized temporarily, protective reflex to stop it from injuring the bone further. Uh -huh. It becomes red, it becomes swollen, painful. All of these are the classic signs of inflammation. And then after a few weeks, the injury heals, the bone fracture heals, everything goes in reverse and you're back to normal. Except in 1% of people. It doesn't go in reverse, it persists. Even though the bone is healed, the tissue injury persists, it becomes larger and larger and larger, red, bright red, warm to the touch, throbbing pain, excruciating pain, often driven to depression, sometimes even suicide. Mm. No known cure for this. There are 30 different treatments that have been adopted. No known cure. But sympathetic, sympathetic ganglionectomy helps somewhat, just to be fair. Mm. But it's an invasive procedure. What people in England have found, following some of our suggestions, is using a mirror, you can give visual feedback saying this arm is not paralyzed. It's in your head. Move, move the normal, reflect, normal hand. It looked like the, fat, the, the dystrophic hand is moving with impunity, the first time without any pain. The de patient develops a phobia that any time he moves, there's pain. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, it gets stuck with the pain, and the pain then causes further tissue changes in the tissue. The cycle you interrupt by giving him visual feedback, saying that the hand is moving again. Mm. And this seems to not only, on, on the table while you watch, the, the temperature seems to drop. Mm. The swelling seems to drop. Mm. And in a matter of a few days, a few weeks, is completely cured instead of having it's being stuck with it for a, mm. see, several years, it, it gets cured. Mm. That's one striking example. There are many other little examples we've seen in our mm. field and uh, experiments, mm. which, which, which suggest a tremendous amount of interaction between these modules. Mm. It's not this isolated modules, which are doing, each doing uh, autonomously, doing its own thing. Mm. That's, that's a good place to start, but it's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. How about some of the very bizarre um, syndromes that you've studied where 
where somebody will think that their wife or their friend is, is an imposter or, uh, or that uh, you uh, ha have a limb that you think is, you want to amputate it or it's not yours or something. Yeah. It's a very strange phenomenon. Well, let's take the example of the amputation of the, of the leg or the arm. We all know about phantom limbs. When an arm is amputated, the con patient continues to vividly feel the presence of that arm. Right. It's moving, it's grabbing a phone when it rings. It feels very real, even though he's not delusional. He knows it's not real. The converse of this ph phenomenon is very poorly understood and nobody knows about it. Very few, very few psychiatrists have heard of it, or neurologists for that matter. It refers to the fact that I, I, met, I met somebody not long ago, a patient who came into my office, he was a dean of an engineering school, oh. very respectable position in society, very honorable guy, very good sense of humor, everything was normal, except he wanted his left leg amputated above the knee. There was nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with him. And I said, is it painful? He said, no, it's not painful. It just doesn't belong to me. I want it removed. And I come out, I've had this urge from early childhood, and I'm coming out because I'm retired, and my spouse is willing to go for it. So we're going to amputate. And he took a felt pen and drew the line along with the amputation. Exactly where, yeah. And I said, if it's some vague propensity to get rid of the arm, why, why should it matter exactly where it's cut? There are all sorts of theories about it, including Freudian theory. The reason a guy wants want a stump, arm amputated, for example, is to create a big stump that resembles a giant penis. <laughs> this is found in textbooks. It's kind of rubbish, you know. <laughs> so I said, this can't be right. There might be some other physiological explanation. So what, what's the explanation? A postdoc in my lab, Dr. Paul McGeer from Edinburgh, and I started studying this. First of all, is it real? We found several patients who have this. It's not very really rare. It is rare, but it's not that rare. And we studied these patients and we said, well, okay, maybe this, this arm is not represented in the brain, congenitally. Oh. The map is missing oh, that's a that good, arm. That's a good, yeah. The rest of the body is mapped onto the surface of the brain, but that arm is missing, yeah. congenitally. Yeah. Then there would be something strange, right? So we said we can test this by poking it with a needle and measuring galvanic skin response, mm -hmm. which is if I poke it with a needle, it must just go up the spinal cord uh, yeah. into the um, limbic structures, right. eventually down the hypothalamic nuclei, down the sympathetic nervous system, you start sweating. Right. You get a skin, change in skin resistance and you withdraw the hand, it's painful. It's only slightly poking around, you just st st hand, hand stays still, but it still feels, feels odd. And you, you measure the galvanic skin response, the resistance changes, okay? Mm -hmm. But this is all light detector tests. Mm -hmm. Now you put the, the electrodes on, on this patient, on this hand, and this is the offending hand he wants to remove. Yeah. And I said, if you touch this, maybe he'll find it, you, you find it less of a response, yeah. galvanic skin response, than if you touch here. Which would indicate that something's missing. Something missing, okay? So we did that, and we touched him above the line where he wanted amputation, below the line of amputation. Question is what happens? Exact opposite. We found that above the line of amputation is normal, of course. Below the line of amputation is a huge galvanic skin response. Oh. So there goes our theory, we said. <laughs> but this often happens in science, and when, when it happens, you, you haven't paid careful enough attention. Because it's exactly what you would predict. What's happening is, when you went and looked at the brain, all the brain areas were normal, sensory area was normal, and you mapped it, right? You touched here, sensory areas were normal, even though he was saying he wants it removed, right? Yeah. So that, 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 that's out. If you go higher up in the brain, superior parietal lobule, where you construct your body image, convergence of different signals. Yeah. Touch, vision, hearing, smell, all of these signals come together in superior parietal lobule. Mm. That center was missing the arm. Uh, uh, okay, right? uh. so, so the, the early centers, sensory areas are normal, pathways are normal, but the master map yeah. that, where everything converges is missing that center. So the sensory signals go in right up to there, nowhere for them to synapse. And the brain abhors discrepancies. Discrepancy is sent to the amygdala and, and uh, insular cortex, which picks up the discrepancy and expresses itself with this vague, incomprehensible, ineffable weirdness, and you want the arm removed. Arm is removed, most of the patients, depression lifts, they live happily. <laughs> what this is suggesting is you, you take something utterly bizarre and incomprehensible, this is what the satisfaction of being a scientist, neuroscientist or neurologist. Utterly incomprehensible, bizarre syndrome where a person wants his arm removed or claims his mother is an imposter, <laughs> and reject the Freudian theory, that this is a big phallus, yeah. and then to replace it with a scientific description of what's going on in the brain, and maybe, maybe perhaps help some of these patients in the future.